I want to do something like we're always talking like there, there's always these memories or experiences in life that sometimes get forgotten or you want to share with people, but you can't keep them straight. So here, here's a good icebreaker I'm going to do. Abby, I'm going to start with you. Now, what is the first concert, music concert that you saw that you remember? I, I went I went to the Eagles. That was the that's Eagles. my I know. <laughs> I know my first concert. Hey, the Eagles. Take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it was my first concert. I don't remember them being my favorite band. I don't remember why that happened to be the first concert. I think I went with a boyfriend of mine who was a race car driver and I think his I think his dad took us. <laughs> Who's that? The Eagles. Sorry, I wish I had a better. Story. No, I, I can't. I, I can't really make fun of it because my first concert oh, was yours. was Billy Joel, and my second concert was <laughs> Billy Joel. So I, you know, so I think maybe that's the thing. You were taken to these shows, but now hopefully Angela, because usually your first concert, if it's cool, if it's amazing, if someone's like, I, I saw the Sex Pistols, you know, I saw the, you didn't because you're young. So Angela. Your first concert. Yeah, it was not, it wasn't cool. It was not cool. Um, cool as the Eagles, Angela? It, <laughs> no, it was like, honestly, probably some like little like punk band from Poughkeepsie. Cause that was really my scene in high school, okay. like punk music and especially like the local like pop punk. Um, we need a band name. I really liked this. Sparks the Rescue, I really liked. It's so cringy now. But see, that's that's um, still kind of cool, though. I mean, that's not like. But okay, what 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 about like an arena show, like a big band that you know people have heard of? What, what's the show? Um, that... Well, Winnie had my daughter. Winnie had an amazing first band experience. Who's that? She was. Um, she went to see. Well, so Ben used to work with this band called OAR, mm -hmm. and when they were playing a few years ago, Ben got Winnie and, and Ben and I tickets and he got her to go backstage and meet the band and basically watch the, watch some of the show from behind the stage, get pictures with the whole band. She will never forget that, that first show for the rest of her life. That's... Totally spoiled. We, we, we knew it. As soon as it happened, we were like, Oh, this is, this is horrible. Why did we do this? Because she's never going to enjoy another show again. She got she got lucky though because she got a musical mom and also a dad like that's crazy into music. So it's different. Like for for my parents, you know, it wasn't like they like music, but my mom. It's like my mom took me to like Broadway shows. Like that was her thing. She liked show tunes. My dad like you know like every dad Frank Sinatra or like you know fifties. My music. dad's in a little band. Oh, okay. they play like yeah. My dad's super musical, um, like total opposite of like sporty dad. Mm -hmm. He like grew up playing guitar since he was like seven. And now he's like, our basement is like this whole like studio set up. So I guess I probably went to like a couple like shows with him. He was like into like Eric Clapton, but then also like hard stuff like Judas Priest. And... Oh, wow. See, but that's yeah. cool. Like that's something again, your dad knowing this, like when I remember talking to my dad and I was like, I know you're a huge Frank Sinatra fan. Have you ever seen him? And he's like, oh, many times. And he'd tell me about when he was in Vegas and he tell, and I was like, wow, I had no idea about that. Now here's the thing. What's a show. So we said the first show, that's the icebreaker. What's like the one that you'd say is the most memorable. So Abby, you go first. I know what, I know what mine is because something happened at this show. It was a crazy story. You're going to think it's crazy, but you're going to think I'm crazy. I mean, I already do. Um, <laughs> but we went to see a David Gray concert at, um, at, at, uh, at the Beacon in New York City. This was probably 10 years ago or eight years ago, a long time ago. And it was an amazing concert. The show was amazing. David Gray is incredible yes. live. I've He's seen him. Really yes. unbelievable. Like, un right? Yes. He's amazing. Yes. So shockingly and... amazing live, too, because I thought it would be good. But I was like, wow, it's really great. Really good. I mean, basically every single song is incredible. His band is incredible. He's incredible. Everything's amazing. 
And so I'm in the, I'm, we're watching the show and all of a sudden my eye starts really hurting and there's this huge light show going on and, and my eye starts hurting like crazy. And I think I, I don't remember if I had to leave the concert or not, but I had to go immediately the next morning, to, my eye was swollen shut and I had to go to an eye doctor. And I told the eye doctor that my eye had gotten lasered off at the David Gray show. And something happened with his light show. And he, the doctor was like, what? Well, let's inspect your eye. And so he starts inspecting my eye. And he was like, what kind of um, work do you do? Are you, do you work in construction? And I said, no. And he said, okay. I didn't think so, but I had to ask. Because you have a piece of metal in your eye. He was like, you didn't, your eye didn't get lasered off at the David Gray show, but you do have a piece of metal in your eye. So when his light show was going, it was reflecting all over the place inside your eye. Anyways, I'll never forget that David Gray show. What the, Does that count, Gene? Yeah, that counts. And you know what's That's interesting? Insane. By you mentioning <laughs> that, that it does think of, of damage we've done to our bodies at shows. And while I'm not like my friends who've been to like mosh pits and everything. <laughs> well, that's uh, a whole different yeah. podcast, right? I, I, I'd say like the loudest, but also like one of the coolest ones in retrospect, I went to, uh, you know, growing up in Philly, I'd go down with my buddies and it was Neil Young with crazy horse. So, you know, Neil Young has two versions. He has like the acoustic, very, you know, melodic, and then he has one that will split your skull in half. So I went there and the opening acts, it was social distortion, then Sonic youth, and then Neil Young. And those are bands that I, I mean, it's pretty, it was pretty amazing, but I'd say by the time Neil Young was on stage, my friend and like our ears were already like bleeding and you could feel your stomach just being, it, it was amazing. I never felt that much sound power controlling my entire body where at times you had to sit down cause you're like, I'm getting dizzy, but it was incredible. And I would not take that. I'd never do it again. And I suggest everyone earplugs when you go to shows i used to make fun of people for that now i'm i'm regretting it at times but earplugs oh yeah but that was painful angela what about you you have to have something that happened since you went to all these punk shows in the middle of nowhere <laughs> yeah so i actually i don't think i've ever been to a concert where like you know big arena and you have like an assigned seat like i really i don't think i've ever done that but one that really sticks out to me is um I think it was at like Webster Hall or something. Um, but it was New Year's Eve when I went and it was like this band called the Lone Bellow. And so now, and like, they're more like folky, you know, I really grew up from the punk stuff, <laughs> but <laughs> you're progressing. I, yeah, but I just like associate this band now with like this, like awesome show and like this awesome memory. I remember like the lights, they like had it done up all great. They like stopped the middle of their set for like a countdown and like, I had my best friends and it was just like such a like smushy that's, little moment and i just like keep that that's what music has been a big part a big part of my life for a long time we can definitely talk more about about that but um but i'm pretty i'm mad at my my i'm mad at my music roots right now because being at this show this past weekend gave 50 of, of our alumni uh COVID. So, but, um but it, so it was a, a super spreader event. Um, but the, what I was going to say is that there was this, there's this band that I have a really, probably the biggest connection to, um, and which is this, I don't know if you've ever heard of them, Angela, but they're sort of, they sort of have punk roots, but it's called Jack's Mannequin. Yes. Um, <laughs> Andrew McMahon. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you don't like them or not, but. No, I like uh, them. <laughs> so. Andrew McMahon, when I was, um, when I had, I was, uh, the company that I founded before Everplans was called Haystack and Haystack was one of the very first music social networking platforms. And one of the things that we did was we filmed, um, we went to South by Southwest every year. We would film bands, we would interview bands, and then we would post that content. And, um, and the whole idea was that people would, would create playlists of music and, listen to sort of like a very early version of what Spotify ended up becoming. And one of the bands that we interviewed was this band, Jack's Mannequin. I loved Jack's Mannequin. They were amazing. And then, um, and, and he had this incredible album. Um, and it turned out that after he 
recorded the whole album, it, it turned out that he had uh, been diagnosed with leukemia. And the whole album is really all about a person going through this whole experience. And at the time, one of our very dear friends, one of my best, best friends got diagnosed with the exact same type of leukemia. And we played him this music and, and got him into Jack's Mannequin too, and then ended up getting Andrew McMahon to leave a, a creative video message for my friend. And we ended up taking our friend to see this Jack's Mannequin show where Andrew McMahon came. It was his first show after he was in remission from leukemia. And he did the most incredible thing. I will never forget this. He, he tells his crowd that he's back. He is, he's, you know, in remission from having leukemia. He thought he was going to die, but he's, he's alive. And he said, and my fans, you know, are my, my fans and, and music and this whole thing here is what has gotten me through this. And I know you are here for me. I know how here for me you are, that I'm going to jump into the audience right now. And I know you are going to carry me all the way to the back of the theater and all the way back to the stage. And he jumps into the audience and I get the chills right now, even thinking about it. And and the the crowd carried like it was just this mo the most incredible and our friend was there seeing it and when our friend ended up going through his um he he actually had a a, a re he re a, what's it called when you get yeah. get it again yeah um our friend's cancer came back and he was listening to Andrew McMahon's um, song Swim the entire time he said that he was doing one of his treatments to try to get through it. So which, it's like, which album is it? Um, do you know? I think it was called dark blue. That's the or song maybe. on their first album from 2005. What, what's their album? What is 2005 is, is everything in transit. That's the one with dark blue on it. Yeah. It's everything in transit. Oh, it oh I love that one. I had no idea. <laughs> Yeah, so he didn't know when he was recording that album, he didn't know that he had leukemia. And if you listen now to the record, every song is so foreshadowing. He's talking about how he's feeling and 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 now knowing what he was actually going through, it's I mean, if that story's true, it's just pretty unbelievable. It's incredible. So my favorite concert was David Gray, but my favorite artist is is Andrew McMahon because we have this really special. See, now that's another thing, and I, I'm so glad. It's like you read my mind because I wanted to bring up like a special moment you saw at a concert because that is incredibly special. It blows mine away because okay, here's something that might shock you. I love the Indigo Girls, love them. I know. I, I, it doesn't seem that way. Seen them so many times growing up. I love that, you know, I, and and they did something at a show that, that I'd never seen. I was at, uh, I think it was Tower Theater in Philly. And it's like a big place. You know, they play and every time they were there, I'd go down and see them. And it was amazing because they're on stage, just both of them, they're, they're just exactly like how you'd expect them to sound live. And my friend and I, you know, we both like play guitar and like acoustic and you could learn their songs. And at one point we shouted out a request, a song that wasn't even there, a song that we heard them do a cover of on a bootleg. It was called A Love of the Common People. And we had them and they do it because the thing that they do so well is they do these harmonies in it that aren't in the like the original and how they do it together. It was just an amazing song that we heard. So we were shouted it out in the concert and it's a big theater. And they said, you know what? We haven't played that in a while. It's around the holiday time. So we're going to do a Christmas song and we're going to do that. So let's do it. They did it, played it. And afterwards, I went up to the stage because, you know, it was a nerdy thing. I'd like to see like playlists and set lists and everything. Saw their set list that was right on the stage. It was not on there. So I was like, my, fr crazy. my friend John and I were like, they actually, the Indie Girls actually played a song that we requested. We got to hear it live and they, in the middle of a show that they did. And after that, I just felt like, wow, this, they are like into this. And also, you know, that whole Atlanta, you know, with REM and, 
and so many bands came out of Atlanta at that time. And a lot of people think of like the eighties or late eighties as just like pop synth and all that stuff. But there was really amazing musicians. What, what are your, what's your favorite, what's your favorite Indigo Girls? Is that your favorite Indigo Girls song? I, you know what? I just like their albums. I would memorize. Like, in fact, I recently, occasionally I'll go down like a YouTube hole and I'll just be like, let me just see like live performances and they're still performing and they still sound incredible. I mean, have I ever played you my, have I ever played you my version of Kid Fears that I sang on? No, but you better. That's, that's a thing. <laughs> I mean, cause most people I think, of, I never played it you. you know, most people think of, you know, obviously their biggest hit closer to fine. And then Galileo had some and Landa Kane, but I mean, their songs at the time too, everyone was like, people I know would make fun. They'd be like, Oh, it's, they're trying to be so smart and it's so collegiate in their poetry. And I was like, it's really, they're, they're incredible. And, and a lot of people are amazing. Would... Indigo girls are amazing. Yeah. Who do, I mean, they're incredible singers. Yep. They're, I, I, I love Indigo girls. I didn't know you loved Indigo oh, girls, my God. Team, but I'm going to play you. And I mean, I people know, look I know all Indigo girls. I have such like, you know, again, like people look and, you know, I, of course I love, you know, I was into like Elvis Costello, seen him like 15 times, like all these people, but like a lot of the shows, the people I love seeing were the ones that when I'd see them live, it was better than albums. And that was something that was always impressive because I'd look at that talent and say, you're doing this every night. Like anyone could be in a studio and really get it right. But to go out there and to be able to perform especially as stripped down as possible. And I think a lot of it had to do with like MTV unplugged at the time because of watching bands and you'd see exactly how talented they were and how good. And that's why when you'd see bands like Nirvana or Pearl Jam or Alice in Chains that were totally the opposite of unplugged. And you'd say, wow, this shows that they really have this ability. The okay. Well, so should I bring it back to acapella for a minute? Yes. Do you want me to, do you want, okay. So, so this was another moment, but this doesn't really, I don't know if this counts. But I was a freshman in college and I went, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, Penn, and it was freshman performing arts night where freshmen come and all of the performing arts groups on campus per, uh, perform to try to get people interested to join their, their clubs or their groups. And I went to this event and this guy gets up on stage and his name is John Stevens and he performs this song. And he was so incredible that I called my mom after the show. He was in this, in this acapella group at Penn called Counterparts. And I called my mom after the show and I go, mom, I just saw somebody who's going to be famous. His name is John Stevens. I have no idea who he is, but I want to be in their group. And I auditioned for their group. John Stevens turns out to be John Legend, um, later became John Legend. And, and I ended up auditioning for his group and auditioning for all the other group, all, all the other um, similar acapella groups at Penn. And I ended up getting into the two top, I, I got into John's group and I got into their rival group. And John, my claim to fame is that, first of all, seeing him in this, in this way when he was a senior in college and he was just so incredible and unbelievable. You just knew it looking at him that this guy was so gonna be so we didn't know at that time how famous he was gonna Story be just but... blows my freaking mind and that's not, not just little fame that's not and just like he, hey i've heard so... of him it's like everyone like from children to grandparents know him so he's crossed well generations he cro of fame. Well, but at that time he was this nice guy at this in this college acapella group so he calls my house because he knew I got, he was the president or music director that he was in charge of his group. And he called, he, they tried to recruit me and he called my house. My, my, I was in Washington DC where they hunted me down for, it was in September. So it must've been one of the Jewish holidays. And I was home with my family for the Jewish holidays and the phone rings and it's John Legend calling at the time he was John Stevens, <laughs> but it was John Legend calling. It was still like a celebrity was calling me because this guy was like, you know, so incredible. And he was like, you know, we'd like you to uh, join our group. What do you think? And I said, well, I'm going to have to think about it because I got into this other group. That's really good too. And he said, well, I forget exactly what he said, but we'd like to take you out to dinner 
to the fanciest restaurant on Penn's campus. So I said, okay, well, that sounds really exciting. So they took me out to this fancy dinner at the, at this, it wasn't that fancy, but at the time I thought it was really, it was the fanciest restaurant on Penn's campus. It's called White Dog Cafe. I, I thought you were going to say Jim Steaks. Um, it was down on South Street. It was Street. like the place you go with your parents <laughs> when they come. I mean, uh, granted, this was a long time ago. I don't know what's nice anymore. And then, and then uh, the other group comes and they try to recruit me too by, they came and had their entire group come to my dorm room and serenade me with multiple songs. And then their music director and president of this other group called Off the Beat ended up talking to me for three hours, convincing me why their group was better than counterparts. And I ended up choosing Off the Beat and turning down John Legend. And, and, this, <laughs> and this started the feud of, of, of Abby and John Legend <laughs> that <laughs> lives to these days. I showed you huge, successful worldwide recording he's artist. He's obviously still thinking about it. He is. I, I, I hear it in his songs when he's singing that, that all of me, <laughs> all of you, it's really about how he lost Abby to his group. But you <laughs> saw someone, because how many people have you seen that you're like, oh, this person might go on to something, but you seem to know the moment you saw him that, wow, this is no joke. Like he's the real deal. You know, that's what's impressive. It was, yeah. Because how many people have you that's seen? So there was no, no denying it. That's not my special concert moment, but one of my dear friends, Carolyn, um, at a concert, we were like maybe 15, maybe. And she sees this guy on the stage. She's like, he's really cute, kind of into him. They talk, whatever, after the show. And she says, I think I'm going to marry him. And, you know, everyone says that when they're, like, 15. They just got engaged in January. They've been together, yeah. yep, for, like, 10 years. They just got engaged. And wow. she, like, was like, yeah, I just I just knew when I talked to him that that was, that was my guy. Wow. That, well, that's funny. That's amazing. That's actually a that's part what of my the... husband would say when he, when he saw me. <laughs> <laughs> the, I'm going to marry that, that singer. <laughs> I'm going to marry her. That's what he said. That's what he's, that's his story. He said, when I walked, when I walked in the door, he knew I, I did not feel the same way, but he did. You're still coming around to the thought. You're like two kids in living together. You're like, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it works out. That's what's amazing about these stories. Cause you realize that, especially when it gets down to like marriage, someone that, you know, a huge part of your college experience a huge part of your life, things that kind of inspire you occasionally when you do go down a YouTube, you know, video hole where you're like, let me see if these bands are still playing or seeing performances that uh, uh, of that era that again, years ago, you couldn't before YouTube, but now you could go on there and you could put together lists and playlists and say, this kind of mm -hmm. tells a story of my life the same way you would a mixtape. But I think even better because you could see the band at that time. And it reminds you of you at that time. I have another meet cute, my oh. parents. So like I said, my dad's a musician, like was in a band most of his time growing up. He's now in a little old band band now. It's really cute. <laughs> um, but to set the scene, it's the 70s, 80s, early 80s. Um, he's wearing leather pants, you know, playing at Battle of the Bands at some bar has no idea, hasn't met my mom yet, but they figured it out after they had been married for a few years that she and her cousin, she was underage, but she would like go sneak into the bars to watch all these bands play at Battle of the Bands every single year. So she was like, I've definitely seen him play like 10 years before I even met him. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Imagine if there's footage of that though. If there is like, now there would be footage of everything. But if there was footage of like, wow, he's on stage and they pan the crowd and there's your mom underage <laughs> trying to hide from the camera, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dancing <laughs> up and down. That's what, that, it makes it so important because you realize the more you think about it and the more shows you think you've seen or the more songs that matter to you, it, you know, a lot of people think like, what are those meaningful ones? Cause it's hard to pick like your favorite band or your favorite song. Uh, but keeping that stuff together, it does kind of bridge people together. Cause if you, 
I'm personally, if you've met someone who said like, oh, I don't care about music, I don't like it at all, then you'd be like, wow, uh, we, you're a sociopath. There's something wrong with you. You need to get help because it's everyone, even people I know that you think wouldn't be into anything, have some song, something that means something to them and why it means something to them. And getting that stuff down, like these stories, everyone should do this. Everyone should sit around with their family because I guarantee people like when I talk to people that grew up in England and they're like, yeah, I remember these two guys they'd hang out and it turns out to be like Led Zeppelin. And I'm sure years before that, they're like, yeah, I used to be in a bar and it turns out to be the Beatles or it turns out to be, yeah, this guy, he was good on guitar. And it's like Jimi Hendrix, so like someone they saw early on. And you're like, wow, you actually experienced something that no one else, you know, that very few people did. And everyone has those. And it kind of then leads to things where you start listening to music. I listened to a lot of early rock because my dad would play tape in a car that had like, you know, little Richard and Chuck Berry and, and those things that ended up becoming really influential in my life later when I realized, wow, this was like history. This, these are, these are musicians that paved the way to everything we're listening to now. And a lot of them that didn't even get the credit for it, especially when you listen to like old soul, you know, old blues, it really makes a difference. And I know we work with people that are crazy into jazz and things like, you know, where they, they have their families playing along with them. And knowing where that comes from means that it's more than just a story or a song. It actually becomes part of your life.